Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Let's begin in prayer. Thank you, Father, for loving us, calling us to be your children, and watching over us for all that you do for us, for providing for us, caring for us, protecting us. Give us a great day today that we might honor you and glorify you. And as we begin this morning by continuing to look at at the resurrection of Jesus, and as we're discussing this morning ways that we can reach out to the skeptic, things that we can say and show to the skeptic to cause them to, to look at this as well. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for loving us. Give us a great day in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue this morning in our series on the resurrection of Jesus through the work of Dr. Gary Habermas and through the work of Credo Courses. The session we're looking at this morning is Changing the Skeptical Mindset of the Naturalist, Part 2. Last week we looked at Part 1, where Dr. Habermas presented some techniques, topics, if you will, for discussion concerning how to engage the skeptic, the naturalist. And he talked about new uh, logical arguments such as the Kalam cosmological argument and the ontological argument. He talked a little bit about fine-tuning and how everything on earth is just perfect. And if it was just a little bit less perfect, we wouldn't be here. He talked about intelligent design, the fact that design requires a designer. Design doesn't happen accidentally. And he talked about uh, the new scholarship that's going into uh, um, historical aspects of Jesus actually working miracles. And uh, then uh, the fifth one that he uh, talked about was Jesus predicted his own death and resurrection. And this morning, Dr. Habermas continues. He gives a little bit of a brief uh, review, and then he continues on with some of the the topics, and uh, we'll have some discussion about that at the end, as well as uh, he will talk during this uh, this lecture this morning about the Shroud of Turin, and I have another short video following Dr. Habermas concerning the Shroud of Turin. So uh, let's continue on then. Dr. Habermas and the Reaching the Mind of the Skeptic natu of the Naturalist, Part 2. When we talk about courses at uh, Liberty, we like to review uh, objectives so that we all stay on board with the syllabus sort of thing. And that's why I keep going back and saying a few things before we start. This is part of a three lecture set. Lectures here. Where we're talking about what would have to change skeptic to view miracles differently. We're talking about the skeptical mindset. We talked about Extraordinary, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Talks about critics who would say any naturalistic theory is better than the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection just garbage. We talk about that. What would have to change the world? Ten total was nine, but I added in the middle of my last lecture. Into four categories. Now, it depends on what you do with the, the last. One. You could move that up to God, and there'd be three categories. What is, there's at least three general moves you could make to see this world differently. 
Pro is able to open up the existing circles. The first suggestion is not exists. The miracle question is entirely different. Second category, which we battled. We just started last lecture, we finished this lecture. If Jesus is a miracle worker, the miracle has changed entirely. And we're going after that. If Jesus is a miracle worker, the question of resurrection is different. And under Jesus be uh, wonder, God, we just new philosophical arguments like the ontological argument or the colonial argument. Uh, fine tuning, intelligent design. If any or all of these indicate that God exists, then we'd have to be more open to Okay, second category of evidence. If Jesus is a miracle worker, we're going to have to be more open to evidence. If Jesus is a miracle worker, and in that category, we discussed new evidence that Jesus did miracles. And use the examples of Ron Twaltree and John Meyer. That somewhere between just a little under half, three quarters of Jesus' miracles are well evidenced, and well evidenced equal. Backed up by the criteria that we defined in an earlier lecture here. Now, under the miracles of Jesus, we discussed two things last lecture that Jesus himself did miracles within his own lifetime and that he predicted his resurrection ahead of time. If you count resurrection, is the case of miracle, then Jesus did miracles uh, predicted his resurrection. Now, I'll just throw another one in here. When critical scholars define the they do something that many people frequently don't. Here's something: true miracles, healing miracles, and exorcisms. Not very many evangelicals account exorcisms as miracles, but critics do. So I'll just make this comment: if we have evidence of exorcisms, or if we have evidence that would be say that will say something else about this world that opens up the supernatural. For example, Marcus Borg, of all people, says. He says, I don't think you know. It's a study by a psychiatrist. This is Marcus Bork, famous founder of uh, He cites a psychiatric study of, I think, 20 cases of psychiatric problems and a panel of psychiatrists was put together to explain what's going on in these cases. And as Marcus Borg's story, as I recall, they could explain 18 of the 20 cases, but they couldn't explain two of them. A panel of psychiatrists couldn't explain two of them. Marcus Borg says, is this team? I don't know. He just leaves it. It's very intriguing. Let's see if that's another if he did exorcisms, Change the miracle question. If there's a I look at miracles differently. If this exercise, I look at miracles differently. If Jesus had time, because I made a comment in an earlier lecture, if Jesus predicted his miracles ahead of time, that's like the name in the back of the column that we discussed the other day. That's the kind of thing that says made by made in China. That's the people in the back of the Collar, because if you predict something and then you do it, that shows some control. And this universe are such that God controls this event. I got to be more open to this event. The present moment here. I've got five more areas to talk to you about today. Again, let me remind you what these areas are. These are two evidences that have only come up in the last twenty years, or subjects where the subject is first century evidence is the last twenty. Okay, so one or the other. And uh, with that, we're in the category of Jesus is a miracle worker. And we've already discussed under Jesus is a miracle worker. Criteria show that he did miracles. He may have done some exorcisms. And we ended by saying, that looks like Jesus predicted his resurrection ahead of time. Let's do one more. I am very impressed. You've been around me very much. 
you know, I am very proud of Keener's two-volume set entitled Circles, published in 2011 by Baker Academic, a continuation of the same idea. Craig is mainly, he tells me in his book, he's aiming it at David Hume. He says, David Hume says, the uniform case against miracles, uniform experience opposes all miracles. Now we know that's not, we know it's a gross overstatement. Some people claim they've seen 20, 50 miracles in their lifetime. Same claimed only you've seen two. But the point is, you experience does not for miracles. Hume's wrong. In in the course of doing thousands of miracles, I've got to ask Craig how many are in the two books. I don't know the answer to that. But in trying to show that there are thousands of miracle claims out there in the world, a select few of his, I don't know, maybe and he's got post CAT scans, pre and post MRI, post uh, X rays. And here's a few examples. If you're interested in a few examples, exciting. In one case, a Russian woman, these are from all the Russian woman had to have her spleen removed for medical reasons. Her spleen was removed, she was praying for. She goes to the post op checkup. I mean, I just did this with my father just in the last week. I've gone to my father checkup and making sure everything's okay. I mean, I got kind of got a feeling of what they're going through in the church. I mean, how do you pray for checkups? Well, the damage has already been done, quote unquote. Spleen's already been done. But let's just pray that that anything's caught at time. My dad had to do with the sight. My dad's only got partial vision in one eye. And if he loses anything else, he's going to be blind. I this right, so let's pray for the post op checkup. So she goes in the checkup, she's got a spleen. Yes, you did. Here's the scar right here. We got the post, but you got a spleen. All right, I don't know what else to say. Let's just move right on. Here's another one a child, a diseased kidney. Dramatic event family that's got little children. And uh, they removed the church prays. No infection. Not everything. Want to go for post op checkup. Kidney. Kidneys. We took one out. Yeah, I know. Here's the pre and post. We got two kidneys. Wow, isn't God good? Well, most like to see. That example comes up so much. I name a different one. But the one a lot of skeptics is someone to pray one leg that's shorter than another, and the leg grows immediately on the spot to be as long as the longer leg. That's what they want to say. Well, I know of at least two cases. One is the leg. A little girl has a difference in her two legs. I'm thinking it was two inches or something. A significant difference. They prayed, and her leg grew over a period of time, a week or two or something. She was like 10 or 11 years old at the time. Her leg was an orthopedic surgeon. Just a neat little side note. But here's the one that really gets me. This might be my favorite one. The other leg growing is this little girl who's a surgeon, but here's the other one. How does foot foot operated on? Now, this kind of liberty uh, daughter just adopted a young boy from China at two club feet. They just did the surgery to straighten out his two club kind of a this just happened lately. Per pretty System that goes out to all liberty people and pray for this. Club feet. And there's a case in Christ where a little child was going in to have their club foot. And then the came in that morning. One last time, hands on the child to pray. And the, the pastor says to the surgeon, 
the surgeon says, go for it. Oh, say parenthetically, informational footnote. You might think that the doctor either was a Christian or the doctor was just being kind. But in a recent survey, almost 70%, I believe it was a survey, almost 70% of medical doctors who are often thought to be among the most uh, skeptical members of society, Almost 70% of medical doctors say they believe in murder. And then the follow-up question asks, but how many have you seen? Well, not how many have you seen. Have you seen one in your own practice? Almost 40% yes. 40% medical doctors are, but times This doctor comes in. This picture, you know, laying hands on the body and feet. And the doctor says, I was kind of cheating. I kept my eyes open. His brain. And I watched that little boy's club foot open up and do surgery. The leg gets longer. The kidney. And there's a number of other ones that are just that bombast with pre and post checkup. And here's my question. Today, but they've occurred in Jesus. Sure. So we often say Greco Roman historians, historians, almost no Greco Roman historian failed to report miracles. You say, oh, that was such a gullible time. And there's omens in the book, and there's prophecies, there's portents. Like, I saw the angel of death last night. He told us we're going to lose this big guy. I mean, all kinds of things. And these are reported in ancient histories. are so gullible. Craig Keener's right. Those Greco Roman historians. Gospels could be right. Jesus could be a miracle worker. And here's my sixth point. Miracles are occurring today. Indication that Jesus did miracles. And I mean, at least it could be. It could be. Jesus predicted his resurrection at a time. And all of these would make resurrection would make the playing field. I'm not saying it would make the resurrection more likely, but it should cause a skeptic to have a playing field to look at the evidence as opposed to the didn't happen. Interesting evidence didn't happen. I explain that. Didn't happen. What if this fine team? What if Jesus what if we have evidence that Jesus did miracles? What if Jesus did exorcisms? What if Jesus predicted his resurrection ahead of time? What if miracles are happening today? You see what I'm saying? Maybe this is just the kind of you know, I mean, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big Tolkien fan. I'm a big Lewis fan. And I often wonder, would it be cool if this were like Middle Earth? Would it be cool if this were like, yeah, you know, and that was really the nature of the world? And then I say, bingo, what if it's in the world? All ever Christmas. Just act of all the time, breaks up whatever he wants to. What if, the, what if Jesus Christ is right? What if the de case, what if his exorcism? No, and time is not big. You know, this world that I always wish this, that, that, that this were. My point being that if this is Jesus's. If this is the world we live in, it could be comparatively less evidence for direction because it's the nature of the world. All right. Next two episodes, seven and eight. Seven and eight have to do with the resurrection of Jesus. And these are examples where the event is new, 20th century. We have said this week that the most exciting new evidence for the resurrection is the creedal evidence that, that links 30 AD to 
50 AD. It's the answer to the question of what did early preaching consist before there was a New Testament book. And the Creed 11 is the most exciting single bit of evidence in the last 25 years. Because it shows that more about this when we talk about evidence, which is the very next lecture after this one. But we start talking about evidence. How evidential, how neat is that? 15, 3 and following gets us back to within a year or two of the cross. Close that gap. Let's find out by the application of criteria general in the study of particular. Start to see a world where the resurrection leave that because the whole course is about that. And here's the next one. New scientific evidence. And it started being initially in the 1960s, but really the beginning was the all out shroud testing week in 1968. We're making about 35 years old. Now I had the privilege of co authoring two books on the shroud. And my co-author, I said privilege, my co was one of the scientists, Ken Stevenson. He was the editor and spokesperson. He was a professor in the Air Force Academy where the start. And he was my co-author. And he was there present for the term in 1978. Really neat story. There's some exciting evidence that the Shroud of Turin could very well be the very good. Now, I'll only tell you one kind of evidence on the shroud. There's a lot of evidence, but there's only one that I would like to talk about this morning. You know, we're trying to get these, these uh, ten in, in just two lectures. The shroud image. I, I've been giving shroud lectures for years. And when you look at the scientific photos and you look at the face of Jesus, that's Jesus. What's purported in the face of Jesus? Underneath his bottom lip, there's some little tiny marks in the hair of his beard. Upon further review, as we'd say in a football game, those are teeth. You can see teeth through the bottom lip. You see teeth and roots up here, too, but especially right here. Now, if those are teeth, how do you get teeth on a photographic image? That is a quasi-photographic image. I'll let you get on your own. But if these are teeth, somehow the image is backlit. And the image is backlit because something from the body is carrying the image of the teeth out. In many, many scientific investigations and tests, it appears that the shroud is caused by two different kinds of radiation. Here's a problem. How does a dead body irradiate cloth? With hundreds of burial garments, and none of them have body images on them. They have blood, they have decomposition, decomposition but not a body image. Where does the body image come from? And where do the teeth come from? Well, I was showing this lecture, I've done this more than once, but I'm showing a lecture and, and somebody in the front row, second row says, whoa, 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 go back to that slide. We go back and look, and this is a chiropractor or a medical doctor or a dentist. I've had it happen with all these. No, no. <laughs> I read actually for a living. Those are teeth. How do you see teeth? You go, something's being backlit and putting the teeth up. Now, I used to say in my early lectures, scientists do not know if this radiation is something that comes in or something out. And these medical doctors and chiropractors say, no, I can answer the question. It's coming out. How? Because if the teeth through the, through the beard, it's got to be coming out. But the man of the shroud is what? Dead. There's a half dozen that the man of the shroud one of the best known of which is he's a mortis. Really hard to fake. He's a state of rigor mortis. 
but the image on the shroud seems to have taken place in where the body is dead, but something's starting to happen to it. Coming through the image. And teeth are being brought up to the present. One of the shroud, he's deceased now, one of the major professor who was on the shroud team. He told me many He told me the image appears to be the image of the skin. If in every core of the skin, we had a micro laser was scorching the cloth. And he paused and said that the kind of energy it takes to create the shroud image were converted nuclear energy and leveled the city of Jerusalem. Through here recently. What if that happened in the city of Jerusalem by converting what it took to the shroud image to a nuclear blast? Reaction on the shroud. Maybe. I mean, maybe. I'm not trying to be fantastic. That's what I get on. Yeah, what kind of a day it is. You know, low probability on some days, high probability on the day. Depends on my workload for a day. Depends on how much sleep I got. But it looks like the biggest death we're catching seconds before the something body's dead as is but what's bringing the teeth up on the cloth this is all basically from 1978 Trump is a very old artifact the science is new in 20th century there are six let me do the last two for you one I can talk to you all day about I can't next to the resurrection the topic that I've done the most on since 1972, it was 28, 38, 35 years. In fact, I'm a reviewer for the for a your death journal. In the world. They call me a Christian reviewer, not because no other reviewers are Christian, but they may be trained in. Well, I, I, I evaluate the religious and evidential and principles. I've been doing this for years for this journal. So I'm evaluating this, but some near-death experiences are so highly evidenced. I do not know a category. I mean, it may be the most highly evidenced religious category in the world. I mean, I, I, I'm not a scientist, so I can't comment on fine tuning. I can't comment on intelligence. I don't, uh, you know, New Testament as much as I would like to about the miracles of Jesus. But some of the near death experiences are extremely evidential. Now, I, I want to give an example by making this example up. This is not a true case. But I have cataloged over 100 evidential near death experiences. I know another researcher who's, I'm sure this overlap, if you compare our list, but she's got over 100 evidence. Now this, would, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. This lecture, and I won't pick on anybody in particular. Y yes, I will. I'll pick on Michael. I'm here to lecture. And all of a sudden, I have a heart attack. And things start moving. Machines go off. And boom, 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 boom. You look down, and it's whatever time it is. Five o'clock in the afternoon. And it's going to be here pretty soon. Here. They were one hour from now at six o'clock. Wow, that was close. that was one horrendous hour. His family here. But Michael says a little bit later, the work he said. I know what y'all. I was kind of like up there watching you. You know, it was me. I mean, for one, hovering around, I couldn't see my face. But secondly, we all identify ourselves with our point of contact. This is and Michael's there, and I don't know what this poor guy is down here. I said, for crap, I thought that's me. But I got bored, and uh, I kind of slipped outside the building here a little bit, and I watched him in the parking lot. Between five and six o'clock, this uh, car accident right here. This, this guy goes through a red, goes through a stop sign, and the blue. 
I mean, you, you just... I give you a blow-by-blow. Blow. I watched it. Oh, this ought to be interesting. Because you're on the ground, and you're out. And we know, let's say he's had cardiac arrest. Not heart arrhythmia or something. But cardiac arrest. We know that in a, in, in a cardiac arrest, you have a flat brain, flat heart in 30 seconds. We know from when approximately he said this happened, it was 15 minutes after he passed out. He's flat brain, flat heart. So to say it, tape recorder's not worth it. You can do that, but he's not going to remember. The tape recorder's not running if you're a naturalist. If he gives a blow by blow, I'm going to call the police department and I'm going to ask for a police report. Michael goes out at 5 revived at 6 o'clock, but he's at 540 when he's flat brain, flat heart. He says, I felt great. In fact, I was just like going down the tunnel, and I knew somebody was waiting for me there. And I couldn't wait. And then I got jerked back into my crummy body because these guys are pounding on me, and I didn't want to come back in my body. But he describes something. But he's got no brain. What do you do when you get a bunch of these? What about a blind person who's never seen anything? The only time they ever see anything is evidence for it. And there are a hundred of these that come on from any point. NDEs argue that there's an afterlife. That's another kind of evidence that opens a path for resurrection. Let me, let's do each of the ones I've done. Before. God's existence. If God exists, we open a miracle. But Jesus is a miracle worker. Well, if Jesus did miracles, I guess we got to be. How about NDEs? If there's an afterlife, resurrection is in the same general category as NDE. These silly naturalists, they're looking the wrong direction. If this is a supernatural world with God, and this is a miracle worker, and or afterlife, I was, I was dialoguing with Richard Carrier one time. It's on my website. You can listen to it. I was dialoguing with Richard Carrier. Richard, the end of that. Richard, I don't know what you can do with talk about NDEs right now. Okay, look, right. Because he, know, he knows how much I've done in NDEs, and he's not. You know, he doesn't it's normal. I said, Richard, if NDEs are residential, then you have to be more open to the resurrection. And he gave me I would have to be. And I would be. If, if, but see, if there's an afterlife, I have to be open to a specific piece of afterlife. I talk about the the, story, the question of what happened to the atheist worldview to open him to we said Jesus now I've suggested afterlife and let me give you a tough one. I don't know where we can put this. We could maybe put it or it can be its own fourth category. How about double blind prayer experiments today? Double blind prayer experiments today. I'll just leave that one out there. But a lot of double blind prayer experiments don't work. There's no Results. As far as I know, the only ones that have ever worked have been done with evangelical. I, I deeply believe God answers. So I don't think we're the only ones who have an angle on it. But there's double blind prayer experiments. That maybe that's another indication that this is a supernatural. World. But all of these ten, started with nine, I, I think these are indications that this might be the kind of world that would open the and if it is, less evidence for resurrection open. Okay. That was uh, some interesting stuff. I have another video that I'll play here in just a little bit uh, concerning evidences in the uh, Shroud of Turin. I'm not a... a uh, an expert by any means on the Shroud of Turin, and I have rejected it as as a fake. Um, but as I have uh, been studying this along with this uh, um, series from Dr. Habermas, I have reviewed some more things on the Shroud of Turin. So it, it uh, I find it a little bit interesting um, the claims that are made, and so I wanted to present this other short video to you that talks about that. But before we go there. Um, he talked about uh, 
um, Richard Carrier, and he had mentioned him before. Richard Carrier is an atheist, um, and he holds uh, he he's one of the leading proponents to uh, Jesus didn't actually historically exist, and um, the discussions that Dr. Habermas has had with Dr. Carrier are interesting, as you have somebody that's uh, arguing for the historicity of Jesus and the resurrection, and somebody that's arguing against the history, historicity of Jesus. And the historicity of Jesus, as we've seen already in this series, is very well documented, not just um, accepting Scripture at face value. And so uh, it's interesting Dr. Carrier is uh, one of those that holds that Jesus didn't exist. Um, I'm also very interested in, in uh, going through uh, Craig Keener's book, Two volume set on on miracles. I need I need to purchase that book and uh, and review that. I think that's fascinating. Uh, I can't imagine what it would be like for the orthopedic surgeon to watch a a club foot grow back while a pastor's praying. That would be way cool. Um, and I agree. If if miracles exist today, you have to have some some acceptance of something other than the natural world. Um, miracles cannot be explained by the natural world because they are, they are antithetic to the natural world. They are supernatural. And so if they actually do exist, then you have to be open to, um, to the natural or to the supernatural world, which then makes the, the potential for the resurrection that much more, more greater. Okay. Uh, the Shroud of Turin is an interesting, um, an interesting topic. It is a shroud that has been uh, that was discovered a number of, a, a long time ago, and, and a lot of tests have been done on it. Some tests have been determined to be wrong. Um, early on, after it was identified, they did a carbon-14 dating test on it, and it appears like that test was in error, and that. That test resulted in it being only about 700 years old, and so everyone uh, assumed it was um, a fake. So when they went back and, and did some more examination, they determined that the carbon-14 dating was in error. And uh, on the video that I'm about to show, you'll see some more information about that. I don't know where I stand on the Shroud of Turin. I don't know that I have enough information yet. Um, the fact that Dr. Habermas uh, has uh, at least some potential for it to be to be authentic uh, piques my interest more. Um, this would be the only artifact that, uh, if it can be proven to be from Jesus, would be the only artifact that we know of in existence um, dating to Jesus and um, dating exactly to his uh, resurrection. And the the new information I just learned this this week. The new information about it being reverse radiation or radiation from behind and how the image got there, I always assumed that it was blood and so forth. There is blood on the Shroud of Turin, but the image is not created by the blood. That fascinates me. And so uh, I did some more research, and, uh, and uh, here's a, a short video on uh, the Shroud of Turin and why some believe that it is actually the shroud that was wrapped around Jesus. In his burial. The Shroud of Turin is a burial cloth that shows a man that was scourged, crowned with thorns, crucified, and pierced with a lance. There is one person that comes to mind who died that way, Jesus Christ. I believe that the Shroud of Turin is the burial cloth of Jesus, and in this video I'll share with you why science appears to confirm this with recent discoveries occurring just a few months ago. The eight reasons I believe, and those that I'll share with you, are one, a replica cannot be recreated. Two, the image is three-dimensional. Three, it matches the bloodstains on the Sudarium of Oviedo. Four, due to new studies on the age of the shroud. Five, due to the forensic analysis. Six, due to pollen grains found on the shroud. Seven, due to coins minted by Pontius Pilate over the eyes of the man on the shroud. And eight, due to AB blood being on the shroud. If you enjoy these eight reasons, please like this video. Share it with others so more people can see it, and subscribe. Thank you in advance. 
The first reason is related to a March 2019 study where a replica of the Shroud of Turin was attempted. The results stated that the perfect reproduction of the Turin Shroud remains a challenge since many other characteristics of the original image have not yet been obtained with any of the processes used for reproduction to date. That basically means that even with the most sophisticated technology available today, we cannot replicate the Shroud of Turin. It's hard for me to believe that in the year 2020, we cannot replicate a centuries-old cloth. A similar experiment was conducted in 2012, and from that experiment, we saw the amount of watts necessary to create an image with just some of the properties. It would look something like this. That was the Dallas Cowboy Stadium. With every light on, 750 megawatts are used. Dr. Paolo Di Lazzaro, who led the 2012 study, told National Geographic that it would take several billion watts to create the image. Another thing to factor in is that 750 megawatts are being used throughout the stadium. What science is telling us is that a dead body would have to exude billions of watts to create the image on the shroud. No mere human could do that. But Jesus, the God-man, could. As he illuminated during the transfiguration, he surely illuminated in an even greater way during his resurrection, which is recorded on the Shroud of Turin for us. Also, it would take 10,000 of these lasers to create the image on the Shroud, which exceeds the maximum power released by all ultraviolet light sources available today. That statement says it all. We don't have the capability to replicate the Shroud. So every Easter, when we remember the resurrection, think about the power of Jesus. Think about that literally explosive power as he rose from the dead to create this image. It's amazing. Now you might be wondering, why can't we replicate all the characteristics of the shroud? This is due to the cloth containing a three-dimensional image, which is the second reason I believe this is the burial cloth of Jesus. Fabrics are not supposed to contain precise 3D images. As you can see here, a three-dimensional image can be taken from this two-dimensional cloth. This three-dimensional nature inspired the Shroud of Turin Research Project, also known as STIRP, which was the most thorough analysis of the Shroud to date. The 33-person team was comprised of experts in various fields who spent 17 months preparing for the analysis. They did incredible work, and here they tested several types of images and were not able to obtain the three-dimensional style that the shroud had. To date, this three-dimensional nature could not be matched. The data from the study actually allowed the face of Christ to be modeled by the History Channel, which you'll see here. The third reason is that the Shroud of Turin matches blood stains on the Sudarium of Oviedo. The Sudarium is the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, as mentioned in John 27. There was a study that compared blood stains as well as calcium and strontium deposits between the shroud and the sudarium. The results suggest that both cloths were used by the same person. The fourth reason, I believe, are due to the new studies that provide an updated age for the shroud. In 1988, the carbon dating results provided a date in the 1300s. This made many people believe it was a forgery for decades. However, in the early 2000s, Ray Rogers was challenged to look into this further, and he discovered that the wrong samples were selected for the dating. Using tape samples taken from the shroud, he concluded, the radiocarbon sample was thus not part of the original cloth and was invalid for determining the age of the shroud. He also calculated a new date between 1300 and 3000 years old. The carbon-14 date has led many people to believe that this is not the burial cloth of Jesus. Although it's amazing that someone from the actual Shroud Turin Research Project wrote a paper refuting that. In October 2019, an analysis of the raw data showed inconsistencies and requested a new carbon-14 date. While these are promising results, a new sample and carbon dating will be needed. The fifth reason, I believe, is due to the medical accuracy of the shroud. The examiner from the research team wrote, The largest blood stain on the burial cloth is on the right side of the chest. It covers the area of the fifth and sixth ribs. The stain very clearly shows separation of blood from a clear watery material. What did John's Gospel say? That after Jesus was pierced, blood and water came out. This is medically confirmed here. The examiner even states, The author cannot help but comment 
that a remarkable consistency exists between the gospel accounts and the forensic pathological findings depicted on the Shroud of Turin. Again, another reason I believe. And I think it's interesting, too, that the examiner states that there's a remarkable consistency between the Shroud and the Gospels. I agree, there is. That's why I believe that the Shroud is the burial cloth of Jesus. The sixth reason I believe is due to the pollen studies. Max Fry used adhesive tapes to collect dust samples from the Shroud of Turin during the 1978 STIRP investigation. He later classified 58 pollen grains by comparing them to pollen grains in the largest botanical museums around the world. He concluded that a majority of the pollen grains were from Jerusalem. Wait, wasn't Jesus crucified in Jerusalem? That's another odd coincidence. Or, it's the burial cloth of Jesus. The seventh reason, I believe, is due to the coins placed over the man's eyes. It was a custom to put coins over the eyes of a dead person so their eyes would stay shut while you're carrying them to their tomb. This was indicated initially by the Sterp team and published in the Numismatist. This was confirmed by imaging analyst expert Robert Haralik, who said the shroud did indeed contain a faint image of the pilot coin. So we have a man that was tortured the way Jesus was, had his side pierced, had blood stains that matched the head cloth attributed to Jesus, had coins on his eyes that were minted by Pontius Pilate, was in Jerusalem, according to pollen samples, and had an explosion of ultraviolet light to create a 3D profile of his crucified body. This has got to be Jesus. There is no natural explanation for this. The eighth reason, I believe, is that there is AB blood on the shroud. The blood that is on the sudarium is also AB blood, and so is the blood from every other Eucharistic miracle. When I read that the blood on the shroud of Turin was the same as all the Eucharistic miracles, I thought, wow, God, you are brilliant. <laughs> so in conclusion, all these reasons point to the fact that faith and science do not contradict. We wouldn't have this phenomenal data without science. This is an example of God illustrating his incredible power through scientific discoveries. Again, please like this video, share it with others, and let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. God love you. Okay, thank you uh, for uh, sitting through that. Um, the audio was not the greatest, but uh, um, there certainly is some things to be reviewed and to be explored about that. If, uh, if in fact, the shroud can be verified and validated as being from Jesus, I don't know how we categorically get there. There just seems to be a lot of evidence that supports it. Um, and if it is determined to be from Jesus, that changes everything. And as I was watching this uh, five or six times over the last week, um, and he's talking about the, the, uh, the radiation, the, the, the amount of, uh, of power and light um, coming that would produce such an image, I wonder if that's what we will go through as we're translated into our glorified bodies and at the rapture. I wonder if that's a symbol, a sign of what's coming and, and perhaps why God uh, protected the shroud if it in fact is real was to give us a little glimpse of what it will be like. I don't know. Things to ponder, things to consider as we uh, uh, research and, and discuss the resurrection of Jesus, and as we uh, look for ways that we can discuss this with our friends and uh, family that, uh, that don't believe. Thank you, Father, for the blessings you give us. Thank you for uh, the things that just make us wonder and, and consider. We love you, and, and we look forward to honoring you and glorifying you every day. Be with us as we continue in the service to follow. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.